my pleasure to introduce Dr. Soha Dola Tabadi. Dr. Dola Tabadi finished medical school in Tehran, Iran, where she grew up. She moved to the US for her advanced training. She completed her internship in Rochester, New York, and finished her residency at Kern Medical Center. She moved to Los Angeles for her rheumatology fellowship training at Cedar sinai Medical Center in 2009. Post-graduation in 2011, she joined Harbor UCLA faculty as an assistant clinical professor. She moved on to open her private practice in downtown Los Angeles in 2014, and she's been practicing rheumatology since then. She loves what she does, serving the community as a rheumatologist. Over the years, she's developed greater interest in inflammatory arthritis, and her passion is spondylar arthritis, including psoriatic arthritis. She's pursued her enthusiasm for education through giving lectures to residents of internal medicine and family practice, and through her work with young people who have graduated pre-med programs and are pursuing medical school. Dr. Dola Tabadi is a member of GRAPA and is an associate member of Spartan. She leads the Los Angeles chapter of Association of Women in Rheumatology and has been able to arrange many lectures and programs for rheumatologists, internists, and other healthcare professionals interested in the field. She is a fellow in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, Andrew Whale Center for Integrative Medicine. So welcome Dr. Dola Tabadi. We're very, very excited to, to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, um, Aline, for having me. Um, thank you, everybody, to give me your uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, Aline uh, was very kind. She asked me to uh, talk about integrative medicine. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago or a year, year and a half ago, and I was still in the beginning of my fellowship. I wanted to wait uh, a little bit, and uh, she was interested enough to ask, and uh, it's really my pleasure to be talking to you today. I am going to share my screen right now and go to the beginning of the um, slides. Sorry. Oh, no, 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 okay. Okay, sorry, let me just go from the beginning. Okay, very good. I apologize in advance if my two German Shepherd girls start barking and, um, but I, I'll do my best. It's the lecture at the time of Corona. Um, okay, so I'd like to speak uh, about the role of integrative um, medicine in spondylar arthritis. As Aline kindly introduced me, I uh, have passion in uh, spondylar um, um, arthritis in general, and I'm also very interested in integrative approach uh, to health and in medicine. Um, I will be skipping or just jumping over some of the information of the slides. I became greedy, so I have too much, um, too much there, but I don't want to bore you with statistics and too much like um, information about design of the studies. So let's briefly talk about spondylose, as many of you are familiar. Um, it is a family of um, R3DDs, including um, AS, uh, which we are trying not to use that term as much, uh, spondylar arthritis, which could be non-radiographic, meaning that you don't have any uh, x-ray changes or uh, cases that had gone on to have some uh, changes in their um, radiographs and radiology. Uh, that family also includes uh, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, IBD, and undifferentiated. Uh, which um, this group, this family of arthritis mainly have involvement of the spine, hence the word axial, but peripheral joints also could be involved. Um, pain, mobility, fatigue, depression, sex life, um, I'm sorry, I put depression twice here, I just realized, uh, could all be uh, a part of the disease. Um, it, there are a family of groups that they start mainly uh, earlier than age of 40, uh, love to aggregate in families, and there's a high uh, association with um, HLA-B27, which is an antigen, a genetic marker. Uh, Main characteristic of uh, this family of um, arth arthritis, uh, inflammatory back pain, which uh, um, accounts for 15% of all the chronic back pains. It's a dull um, ache, uh, 
um, could be felt in the buttocks or hips, as patients um, usually describe it. It's in, insidious in onset, in chronic, uh, usually um, greater than three months, gets worse uh, later in the night or early in the morning. And uh, the characteristic of that is that uh, exercise and activity uh, kind of oils up uh, and uh, removes the stiffness, but as the patient wake up in the morning, they have stiffness. And so period of, uh, after rest, the 30 minutes of stiffness is uh, very significant. Also, uh, patients respond very good to uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen, naproxen, and, um, and uh, so on. And uh, initially, they could be sporadic, but then uh, if untreated, uh, they could become a chronic uh, pain and chronic problem. Anthocytes is um, another feature of this uh, family. Uh, basically, they become tender points in those areas that you see. Uh, so patients can have uh, anterior chest wall, the, the front of their chest, side of their hips, side of their knees, and the back of their heels uh, could be painful. What are the other symptoms? Fatigue is a common, uh, common problem, and unfortunately, a lot of us forget to ask patients about fatigue. Um, so there, we're, we're trying to raise awareness of that. Um, sleep disturbance could be another one um, that nearly 81% of female patients and 50% of male patients complain about that. And again, as I was describing the inflammatory back pain, it makes sense why the patients have sleep disturbance uh, because the pain can wake them up in the middle of the night or nocturnal pain. And fatigue also uh, could be uh, due, to one of the reasons that patients uh, feel fatigue is due to uh, lack of restorative sleep. Um, uh, we see high level of uh, depression, especially when, uh, when the conditions are not treated. Um, pain is the major, uh, major factor um, of, uh, of the symptoms. Uh, fatigue, um, there was a um, publication in seminar in arthritis and rheumatism in 2013 looked at the fatigue to see uh, what, what, what is the, how, how common is fatigue. And uh, uh, fatigue was reported to have significant physio, uh, social and physiological uh, effect in patients' life. And in that study, it was interesting that uh, inflammation and what clinicians really saw um, was not as highly associated uh, with fatigue as the pain was. And this suggested um, really additional treatment um, to make sure uh, disease activity is low so uh, patients' pain can go down and patients will not feel uh, fatigued as much. So now I want to talk to you about integrative medicine. Um, so a lot of there are lots of misunderstanding about integrative medicine, and they uh, some scientists and some other physicians think that integrative medicine is to replace the traditional and mainstream, which is not um, uh, true. Um, <clears throat> Integrative medicine is, a, is healing oriented, emphasizing the central, centrality of the patient physician uh, relationship. It integrates conventional and complementary methods of treatment and prevention. And the goal is to remove barriers that may active, activate the body's innate healing response. We all have an innate healing response in our body. And the goal of integrative medicine is basically to wake that up and bring that to, to surface. Um, so it really looks at mind, body, spirit, community uh, to facilitate healing. Um, and uh, it wants to, the motto is, we want to remember healing is always possible even if the cure is not. So um, good medicine, first of all, uh, any good medicine is based on science. Uh, it's inquiry driven, and, uh, but it's open to different paradigms. Um, alongside the concept of treatment, the broader concept of health promotion and prevention of illness is paramount, something that uh, unfortunately in uh, our society sometimes it's missed and we, we focus on disease state too much rather than prevention and uh, promotion of health. 
Um, and uh, so the goal of uh, integrative medicine is first to train the physicians, uh, physician heal thyself, uh, and uh, for us to understand these different modal modalities so we can become good teachers. I always tell my uh, patients, I don't want to uh, uh, preach what, why, what I don't practice. And uh, so it um, neither rejects the conventional medicine, of course, uh, and it doesn't accept alternative therapies uncritically. Uh, um, so I really want to convey that message. Uh, integrative medicine is not about rejecting or forgetting how important the science of medicine is. Uh, we're alive um, the, today, we're, we, we can live longer today because of the progression of science and uh, how medicine has uh, developed and progressed. But we want to make sure that we're looking at other principles as well. So what are the things that are important in integrative medicine? Um, <clears throat> sorry, one quick second. Uh, uh, breathing, sleep, nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, um, guided imagery, relationships, join life. I can go on and on and on, and uh, definitely 45 minutes will not be enough time. Uh, for us to really talk about everything. I just want to touch up, touch up on um, some of the uh, tools that we have available to us in the integrative medicine. And uh, um, you guys can go and uh, find more about it. I'm uh, also available if anybody has uh, further questions. So um, I'm not really going into breathing and sleep, which are my main um main features and main factors in, in being healthy. Um, I just want to tell you that um, in modern days, we have forgotten to actually take breath. Every time I ask a patient, do you have chest pain? Then they, when you take a deep breath, they actually have to take a deep breath to really know if that's happening or not. We have forgotten to do that. We're using a lot of mouth breathing, which is not a healthy breathing uh, in, when we have the nose, which is the tool and instrument of breathing that was designed designed uh, for us. Sleep is another uh, in, important, immensely important factor in our health that uh, a lot of times are overlooked. We don't ask about sleep. We don't really pay attention. We're all addicted to our um, uh, digital um, devices and uh, we go to bed with them. We wake up right away with them uh, and we don't even allow ourselves to really go to a deep sleep. We don't uh, allow us ourselves to wake up first uh, and think about and ponder about the dreams we had. Um, we just jump on checking our phones, which could have a lot of um, health uh, factors, but I will talk about nutrition briefly, exercise, mindfulness, guided imagery, and uh, joint life. So exercise, uh, I'm a stickler about it. Every patient, um, I interrogate about their um, exercise routine. Um, and uh, we know how important exercise is. Uh, conventionally, we know exercises like yoga and uh, Pilates and other exercises that can really open the chest and open the spine are so important for spondyloarthritis, uh, basically to um, counteract what the natural course of the condition would like to do. Um, so these are very important, but I just want to point out two Pilates um, studies that were done. Um, one uh, was published in Internal uh, Rheumatology International 2012, um, excuse me, and that looked at short-term effect of Pilates. Um, so they looked at two different group. Um, one didn't do Pilates, the other one did. Um, the one that did for 12 weeks, they did it and they looked at the patients at week zero at baseline 12 and then 24 and the primary outcome was to see uh, if the functional capacity of the patients improve or not um, they look at different other um, factors like FASDI, which is disease activity but the main one the function uh, functionality of the patients and um, the uh, group uh, which had uh, Pilates for 12 weeks, they had significant improvement in their functional, uh, even at uh, week 24, which was 12 weeks after the Pilates was, uh, was done. And the Pilates was done uh, three times a week. Um, patients were trained uh, with a trainer. 
the other study that was published in jo Journal of Alternative and Complementary uh, uh, Medicine in 2019, October of 2019, they looked at long-term effect of Pilates. So that was 12 months of uh, that. And again, uh, improvement were observed in the function, disease activity, chest expansion, and so on. Uh, which can talk about exercise forever, um, uh, different modalities of exercises. Um, I want to also talk about uh, mindfulness. I love this cartoon uh, because most of us are mindful, not mindful. Uh, and the goal is to uh, go from uh, the former to the latter. What is mindfulness? Uh, mindfulness is basically just awareness, awareness of the present moment. Um, I obviously cannot really see all of you and I don't know what you can hear or see at this, at this point, but if you could just for a second um, listen and hear other than my voice, hear what else you're seeing or hearing, um, that is uh, the point of mindfulness. Uh, not, not judgmentally, right in here and now, uh, whether the experience is pleasant or unpleasant, mundane or exotic, our own thoughts, feelings, or what is going on outside ourselves. Awareness itself, uh, no adornment, no coloration, no good or bad, no desirable or undesirable. Mindful, kindful, peaceful, no judgment. John kabat -Zinn, Dr. John kabat -Zinn is the pioneer who brought mindfulness uh, to the West as a possible um, psychological intervention. Uh, the first to study the connection between mindfulness meditation and pain in 1985. Um, he looked at 90 chronic patients um, uh, were trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction and statistics, statistically uh, showed significant reduction in measures of a present moment pain, a negative body image, um, uh, inhibition of activity by pain. So uh, patients were not inhibited uh, as much by pain. Uh, they had less mood, mood disturbance and uh, other psychological symptoms, including anxiety and depression. And the use of uh, pain-related drug uh, were reduced. Um, Pain is very complex, it is multidimensional. Subjective experience consists of sensory, affective, and cognitive elements, if you think about it. So when we experience pain, we begin to judge it as bad and as something that we want to immediately eradicate and get rid of. Then we start really conspire ways of escaping the pain. And we continuously judge it, again, as negative, um, and uh, we, we just um, want to uh, basically get rid of it, but this whole phenomenon uh, causes um, the pain to become inflated and bigger and makes the experience uh, far more noxious than the sensory experience uh, of the pain. So the goal of mindfulness is, and I want you to please listen to this, to separate, um, uh, suffering from the pain and uh, just look at the pain as is and see if we can minimize the suffering part of that. So um, mindfulness meditation can be used as a tool to create more awareness of the sensation of pain itself without the judgment or resistance and the effective and cognitive evaluation that we often project upon it. Uh, when we impose a litany of negativity upon our pain, it only becomes worse. Um, when we become more aware of what we're actually experiencing, the overall perception of pain can go down. Um, so from this perspective of mindfulness, as John Kabat-Zinn talks about, uh, when a mindful um, person looks at um, anything. Nothing really needs fixing. Nothing needs to be forced, stopped, changed to go away. Awareness of a sensation without the overlay of our thoughts in order to elicit healing. So 
awareness can balance out various inflammations of thoughts, emotional agitation, distortion that accompany the frequent symptom. Uh, these are the frequent symptoms that uh, blow through the mind, especially in the face of chronic pain. Um, it's, it may sound counteractive, but if uh, focus on the pain itself, we might be able to uh, really um, damp down the pain without using the traditional pharmacological intervention immediately. So um, there was a study 2011 by Grant All, and they did functional MRI of patients uh, who practice mindfulness. During the pain, meditators had increased activation in areas associated with the processing, the actual sensory experience of the pain, but they had decreased activity in regions involved in the emotions, memory, and appraisal. So they felt the pain quite good, but their emotional response, what, what lit up in their brain was lower. Um, there was another um, study, but they, uh, they done in 2015, uh, mostly consistent with the same findings. And um, again, mind, mindfulness and pain, uh, it could be a mechanism that, mm, mm, but it may vary based on the mindful, uh, mindfulness uh, practitioner, uh, meaning the more experience one has, they could have different responses. It also depends on the stimulus, and, uh, but we have enough evidence to indicate mindfulness practice does in fact lead to reduction in pain in intensity and unpleasantness of that. Body scan is a very important way of uh, mindfulness practice when it comes to pain. Uh, I don't wanna go through the details of that. Uh, we have a practice at the end that could be helpful, but basically it scans, uh, one scans their own body and they go through the experience of where is painful and where is not painful. And one can distinguish and that could be a, a helpful practice in um, damping the pain. So now I wanna bring your attention to another completely different method um, that I recently got uh, familiar with. Um, Wim Hof method comes from a Dutch gentleman, currently 61 years old, he lives in Netherlands and he uh, had a very tragic event in life. Um, his wife uh, committed suicide and left four kids. And um, he, um, uh, somehow converted that experience to a method that uh, is widely used now. And uh, we can, we can uh, see this uh, movie to get familiar with him. Um, if you take the bits of a dead bacteria and introduce them into someone's body, in all likelihood, the person's immune system is going to flare as if it's under attack. As harmless as dead bacteria might sound, the body will still react as if it's being invaded. These dead bits are also known as endotoxin and are a major red flag for the immune system. When your immune system does find endotoxin in the body, it will trigger the release of different proteins and physiological changes. It will make a person feel sick. Symptoms such as fever, nausea, headache, shivering are caused by your immune system gearing up to fight off infections. This is known as the innate immune response. It's fantastic, you can take any person, inject them with endotoxin, and watch them feel terrible for a short while. And that's what scientists at Bradbound University did with over 100 people, mapping out a predictable innate immune response. Now, it wasn't believed that one could voluntarily influence the innate immune response, but that's exactly what happened when scientists at Bradbound injected Wim Hof with endotoxin. Using the breathing method he developed, he was able to dampen the immune response to the endotoxin's presence by flooding himself with adrenaline and stimulating the release of a key messaging protein, interleukin-10. This was achieved through voluntarily influencing the autonomic nervous system, the same system that beats your heart, remembers to breathe for you, and prepares you to fight or fly in the face of danger. A system that for all intents and purposes should not be controllable because if we did have control over this system, we might forget to breathe or beat our hearts because we were thinking about cake. Yet this is exactly what happened in the case of Wim Hof voluntarily flooding his body with adrenaline, deliberate influence over his autonomic nervous system. So what should be done? The possibility is that Wim Hof had different genetics from the average person, giving him the unique ability to withstand the endotoxin. 
so a larger test was needed with more participants performing the same techniques designed by Hoff. 30 healthy male volunteers were gathered, 18 of whom would be trained by Wim Hoff and the other 12 the control to the larger endotoxin experiment. The 18 volunteers went to Poland to train in a mixture of meditation, cold exposure, and the breathing technique over four days, and would enjoy a gauntlet of swimming in freezing cold water, standing and lying in the snow, and for the ultimate test, climb a mountain at the elevation of 1,590 meters with wind chills of minus 27 degrees Celsius, all done in shorts. Very nice shorts, too. The kind you wear at the beach. Those who weren't trained, the control group, were injected with endotoxin. They exhibited the typical symptoms and reactions of the innate immune response. Not a fun thing to experience, granted, but we suffer for science here and yeah, they, they suffered. During the experiment, a lot of information was kept track of. This included the composition of the blood, cytokines, catecholamines, white blood cell count, and various physiological changes such as heart rate and temperature. This group did not commit to any breathing techniques, simply passively enduring the endotoxemia. The train group, on the other hand, did commit to the breathing techniques during the first 2.5 hours of the eight-hour experimentation, and in the end were successful in dampening their innate immune response. But what happened? Well, let's walk through this. There were lots of fun bits of information collected, and I'll try to condense the more interesting parts. Firstly, most clearly, the train group had a lot more adrenaline from the very start of the experiment due to the breathing, as compared to the control. This burst of adrenaline from the very start correlates nicely with the production of interleukin-10, an anti-inflammatory cytokine or cell messaging protein. Here's the control for comparison. It's a little flatter. The anti-inflammatory element of interleukin-10 is that it inhibits the release of other cytokines that contribute towards inflammation and mediation of the innate immune response. As a result, the train group had a less pronounced release of these inflammatory proteins compared to the control, had less acute symptoms, and recovered faster. Here are the cytokines kept track of in the control. Here they were in the train group. Notice the difference in release. Far fewer in the train group because of interleukin-10. Now, even though the inflammatory response was suppressed, white blood cells were not. Having adrenaline in the system actually stirred leukocytosis, an increase of white blood cells in the blood. Here's a graph showing the control's white blood cell count over the eight-hour experiment, as compared to the trained volunteers. Some of the categories of different white blood cells were also measured, but the experiment was limited in that not all subtypes were counted. So, stirred from adrenaline, it appears as though the immune system was still humming and working in the background, despite a dampened inflammation response. Being able to dampen inflammation is also wonderful news on its own. It implies an interesting alternative to those who suffer from excessive or persistent inflammation especially when considering autoimmune diseases. The study of which this animation is based off is a precursor to more investigation. It had a small sample size, but the results were astonishing. The influence over the autonomic nervous system was probably the most striking part that even Peter Pickers, one of the scientists who orchestrated the study, expressed his surprise. Onze belangrijkste conclusie, ja, dat we nu voor het eerst heel duidelijk en ja, onomstotelijk feitelijk hebben aangetoond dat een mens dus wel in staat is om zijn autonome zenuwstelsel en zijn immuunrespons op een vrijwillige manier te beïnvloeden. En dat was echt iets wat in de tekstboeken staat, dat kan niet. If there's one thing this tells us is that there are deeper layers of our bodies that we can consciously explore, a potential we should study, a potential within our biology, and it's all there in front of us. So, let's have fun exploring. Okay, I had to take my headphone off because I wasn't sure you can hear. Moving on. Um, so, Wim Hof method uh, was uh, actually um, used um, in a very interesting study, Department of Rheumatology and Clinical Immunology in Amsterdam. Uh, they looked as um, uh, at, th at this method to see if it can have any effect on ankylosing spondylitis, axial spondylitis. This study is just a proof of concept. I have to say, um, again, it's very difficult to find uh, any studies of integrative medicine on spondyloarthritis. Um, it's very hard to find a good level of uh, research, um, and we can talk about why, uh, but this was just a proof of concept. Um, they, um, they wanted to see with the breathing method, exercise, meditation, um, and cold exposure, um, is there any uh, effect on spondylos? And um, I am not going to go through the uh, 
design of the study, but again, two groups. Uh, one group did uh, the practice uh, in, initially, the, the second one did it later, and they um, saw um, what differences um, could have happened. Um, Okay, and the, the, the continued patient continued their uh, medication as is. Uh, we talked about the method of uh, breathing and all that. Um, so there was a significant improvement uh, in the activity of the disease during the eight weeks period of intervention. And uh, for example, the patients had even lower inflammatory markers, the uh, component, the physical component got improved, health survey of the patients got improved. Sample size is small, we cannot really use that as a, a method in treatment, but these are just introducing different concepts to us that there are other uh, modalities that we could use in adjunct to our uh, treatments, biological treatment and so on, to help our patients feel better. And uh, now I want to talk about food. Uh, we can talk uh, the entire day about food. I just want to uh, introduce the concept as um, Hippocrates says, uh, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. We really need to think about what we put in our body, um, especially these days with all a different variety of things that we call food, but they're actually not food. So um, briefly about anti-inflammatory diets, um, it's not a specific diet, it's a pattern. Um, and it has um, healthy components of uh, traditional Mediterranean and Asian dietary. Um, so we want to have uh, less um, uh, inflammatory uh, food and more uh, anti-inflammatory food. Um, so the region we are all familiar with, um, uh, it's mainly plant-based. It encourages the regular consumption of vegetables, fruits, whole grain cereals, legume and nuts. Olive oil is a primary dietary fat uh, and uh, the rest of the fat comes from nuts and seeds. A moderate amount of lower fat uh, dairy products, especially yogurt and cheese, butter and cream, uh, fish, shellfish, um, adequate uh, water intake is encouraged. Um, the emphasis is on diverse range of food uh, eaten uh, in season. Seasonal food are very important. Locally grown uh, food are very important to have the freshness and um, nutritional content. And the red and processed meats and food rich in sugars and fats are eaten very, very like in small amounts. Um, the other component of this um, diet is um, frequent intake of home cooked meals. So cooking, cooking together, living together, eating together um, are very important physical activity. Uh, we see fasting practice um, in this region and uh, many people own their own vegetable garden and they also uh, do take uh, adequate rest. The exact mechanism of how uh, it has a favorable effect on mortality and chronic disease, we're still working on that. But we know that uh, it does um, bring down the, the, the lipids. It protects against oxidative stress. It can modify hormone and growth factors um, in, in a uh, favorable way, supports a healthy gut microbiome, which is really important. Uh, and there were, for example, a large st uh, study in Swedish men and women and showed adherence to Mediterranean diet for 15 years can add up two years to their survival. Mediterranean diet and uh, inflammation. We have um, studies also uh, demonstrating that the anti-inflammatory properties of Mediterranean diet, uh, whether it's because of the building blocks such as monosaturated fatty acid carbohydrates that are low glycemic, uh, the bioactive uh, chemicals of the plants, the low caloric intake of the, of the diet, um, uh, the high fiber, um, the anti-inflammatory cytokines that could be secreted, and also, again, the uh, effect on mycobacteria. 
Uh, I briefly put uh, talk about studies that they showed broccoli having some TNF effect and other anti-inflammatory fibers, whole grain, flaxseed, magnesium, and um, so on. The other uh, very good um, diet, um, which is anti-inflammatory, is a Japanese diet. Uh, they consume uh, fish, soybean, um, not processed ones, fruits, vegetables. Um, grains are uh, boiled uh, without oil on average, uh, as you saw in a tray of food up here uh, where I was in uh, Japan. And on an average day, uh, you have uh, oily fish, uh, plain boiled rice, miso soup, uh, seaweed, and uh, pickles and natto. So you have sort of some fermented food, which are really good for our bacteria, and uh, whole grain that is cooked in a healthy way. Again, they promote um, rural and local grown food. Green tea is also one part of the tradition that was shown to decrease CRP. Um, so similar to Mediterranean, um, the focus is on low fat, nutrient dense, um, instead of calorie dense food and lean protein, uh, mainly from fish. Um, and we can talk about pro-inflammatory diet. Um, a diet rich in refined starch, sugar, saturated and transaturated fat. Um, there uh, was a study, women's uh, in the nurses' health study, women with diet based on this kind of food, they had higher CRP, interleukin-6, uh, and other inflammatory markers. I do see that every single day in my practice. And uh, this basically talks about standard American diets. If you know this character, uh, this was SAD uh, from inside out, standard American diet, abbreviated SAD. Um, so um, the thing is we have um, pretty overwhelming evidence in other inflammatory conditions, even like RA uh, showing that um, uh, um, if patients have a high index of fruit, vegetables, legumes, uh, low grain, uh, I'm sorry, whole grain, poultry, uh, there was some association with reduced risk of RA and uh, completely opposite of that high risk of RA in um, sad diets um, like processed meats, refined grains, French fries and all that. Um, but we really don't have good studies on uh, spondylo arthritis. Um, so um, when you ask patients, 78% uh, of patients with AS do believe uh, that um, food has something to do with how they feel, 88% in psoriatic arthritis, 71% in osteoarthritis, and 64% of RA. So we wanted to uh, look at um, studies available. So I looked at the systemic review um, that was published in European Journal of Rheumatology in 2017. They looked at any studies that were done in the past to see if the diet, the food is different in patients with AS versus non-AS and uh, do they have worse disease or not? Um, so these were the objectives. They included observational studies, cross-sectionals, but they eliminated any um, studies that the, the, the number of um, samples, they were low, uh, whatever was published from 91 to 2014. And uh, so in some of the observational studies, um, uh, the, basically two of them were good enough to look at the statistic um, markers and the uh, statistics of it. Uh, only one case control study investigated whether diet differs amongst AS versus non-AS. In that study, one thing that was um, shown was the calorie intake, the calculated energy intake was significant, significantly higher in AS patients than non-AS patients. Um, um, so as I said, it's very limited to no um, information. These are, again, the information we talked about patients, what they thought um, food has anything to do with how they felt. And there was one study that looked at starch, but we couldn't really take uh, so much out of it. There was no association of daily starch intake with uh, the um, health survey, CRP or SED rate. Um, uh, only 1.8% of patients reported improvement when they have low starch. Um, there were other studies um, that looked at um, 
complementary and alternative medicine, mainly uh, those patients were using uh, fish oil, green tea, vitamins, and glucosamine as their complementary measures. There was no significant difference between the dietary, uh, uh, these supplements and the ones who did not use that. Um, in another study, 25 patients excluded dairy and six weeks after a good uh, compliance was shown and amongst those patients, 52% reported good improvement um, to the point that 62% of patients were able to discontinue their non-inflammatory and their NSAIDs and uh, up to 89% they continued, six patients actually were able to continue uh, no daily after two years and they were able to uh, be off of some of their medications. Fish oil also was looked at and they saw in one uh, trial that high uh, dose um, fish oil was significant in, very, uh, in uh, comparison to low dose uh, fish oil. Um, diet and microbacterium, we have more and more studies these days and that AS patients as, and psoriasis patients, microbacteria are different than patients without um, AS and other spondylos. So basically, it's very hard to find studies um, that we could rely on. We can talk about it. I would, uh, I would love to answer questions uh, uh, of why we do not have enough studies in this regard. Um, but uh, it would be really good to um, have studies in the future to look at that. Um, and these are the um, suggested um, uh, ways of why uh, the uh, food can trigger and change uh, microbacteria immune response to do that. It's a very complex phenomenon, but uh, these are the suggested um, pathways. I also want to, want to talk about guided imagery. It's a way of working with the patient rather than focusing on the disease. It's a natural language of unconscious to talk to our conscious mind. Um, and uh, we can uh, use this method uh, for a lot of um, symptoms and uh, conditions uh, for relieving pain and other symptoms. It stimulates healing response of the body and uh, we can help um, people going through procedures and painful uh, procedures in, like in anticipation, uh, it could be very helpful. It's very interactive and uh, it can evoke the patient's autonomy, uh, give patients uh, pathways and ways to draw on their own inner resource to support healing, make appropriate adaptations to change in health and understand more clearly what their symptoms may be signaling. Uh, it's again a natural way uh, that we human uh, our nervous system stores access and process information. Um, and we're very actually familiar with that. Uh, we're all familiar with like sexual fantasies uh, that can um, um, mount responses in um, different physiology, respiration, heart rate, and guided imagery, imagery use the same concept. Um, also, we are very familiar with uh, being worried. When we worry, we know that uh, things happen in our, in our body. Um, heart rate and um, respiration can change. Even the, the response of our immune system can do that. Um, so um, imagery is a rapid way to access emotional and symbolic information uh, in us. Um, a patient can talk about their pain in length, but if a patient describes their pain, for example, that, oh, I feel like a knife is twisting in my back, out of a sudden, uh, you have sensory description of symptoms, you can understand uh, important psychosocial information about the patient, and with appropriate questioning, you can help uh, the patient and you as a, as a healthcare professional to, uh, to get to the bottom of what this pain and all the other surroundings uh, uh, emotion of that is. So um, it, it can work to uh, do relaxation training for stress reduction, pain, pain relief, cancer treatment, even in fertility um, and birthing, uh, we have some information on that. Uh, and it's very interesting because when they did functional MRI, you see that people visualize things or events. Um, when people visualize things or events, they activate the occipital cortex where uh, is the um, 
area for seeing. So as if one is seeing those, if they are um, listening to speech or music, uh, the uh, temporal area of the brain is activated. If they're uh, imagining a movement, the areas of the motor activity in the brain uh, um, activates and so on. So in, uh, for the sake of time, I, uh, I am moving over some slides. Again, um, uh, worry can uh, elicit some physiological effect and then imagery uh, when we control, when we go somewhere that we think it's relaxing and pleasant, uh, we can um, uh, create responses in our body uh, that uh, can happen with actual physically being in an area that relaxes and make you happy, makes you happy. So um, it's very close to physiology, as I said, uh, just like when you look at a lemon, uh, we can start salivation, uh, guided imagery can cause physiological effect very similar to that. Um, so for the sake of time, if that's okay, I'm gonna play and have you practice with this. If you can sit in a comfortable uh, position, uh, it would be great if we can. Okay. Find a quiet place where you will not be disturbed. You can also choose to create a quiet place in your mind. Get into a comfortable position and begin paying attention to your breath. Observe your breathing as you breathe in and breathe out. Try to find a place in your body where you can feel the breath most clearly. This could be your nostrils, mouth, chest, or belly. If you notice that your breathing is short and shallow, see if you can slow your breath down. There's nowhere you need to be right now except here, simply being here with your breath. When you're feeling settled, gently bring your attention towards where your pain is located. Simply observe it. Imagine yourself walking around it and looking at it from every angle. Notice any urges to run away or shrink from it. Try to be with it. Letting go of any fear or dread or any other difficult emotions associated with the pain. Look at it as if you were seeing it for the first time. Breathing with the pain. Try to notice what the sensation of pain is like for you without your emotions creating a struggle against it. Perhaps the pain is dull and aching, like a bad toothache. Or perhaps the pain is sore and swollen, like pain in the joints. Perhaps it is tense and twisting, like a screw tightening, tighter and tighter. Perhaps the pain is sharp, like a pinprick. Perhaps 
Perhaps there's a burning sensation, red and hot like fire. Perhaps the pain is blistering, scalding, like boiling water. Or even perhaps the pain is like an electric shock where you feel sudden zapping pain. Perhaps the pain is throbbing and pulsing like a beating heart. Or it might feel like a tight rubber band, stretched and taut. Now choose the mental image that fits your pain. Focus intently on that image. What might work to reverse that pain? What might be the opposite of this image? For example, if your pain is dull and aching, you might imagine rubbing soothing balm into the aching part. Visualize the soothing balm dissolving the pain. Visualize the balm being absorbed into the skin. If your pain is sore and swollen, imagine something cold and icy on it reducing the swelling. If the pain is twisting in you like a screw, visualize a gentle hand turning the screw so that it slowly becomes looser. If your pain is burning and fiery, imagine a shower or sprinkler putting out that fire. If your pain feels like electric shocks, Imagine that circuit being unplugged. If the pain is fast and pulsating, visualize the rhythm slowing down so that the pulse becomes soft and natural. Relax. Take a few minutes now to visualize your pain fade away as you focus on undoing the pain. Undoing, dissolving, melting, softening, fading. Untwisting, drifting away. You might also visualize the color of your pain slowly changing. You could imagine a dull, achy pain change from a dark area to a light area. You could visualize a red, hot, burning pain slowly change to a cool blue. Mm -hmm. 
Notice that you're feeling less threatened by your pain. Not fearful, not recoiling from it, not struggling with it. Just being there with it, watching it come and go. making space for it, watching it fade away. Like any other sensation in your body, your pain comes and goes. Let it come, let it go. Notice it, be with it. And slowly watch it fade away. Okay, very good. So, um, Lean, I am... Um, one last thing I wanted to um, add. I know we're um, way over my time. Um, I just wanted to uh, last say uh, something really important about joy, joy in life. Um, integrative medicine really focuses on that. And in every visit, we would like to ask our patients what brings them joy. And it's very interesting to me, unfortunately, to see like everybody including me I have to ponder and think for um, a minute or, or, or so to remember things that uh, brings me joy um, and I'm ready for uh, your questions and um, thank you very much that'd be fine so okay I'm gonna jump right into questions um I'm trying to find out what I can do if NSAIDs, DMARDs, and other medications like biologics are out of course of treatment for me. What do I do with outlying pain? I feel like I fit no normal model in terms of um, treatment. Uh, so, um, you know, um, it's really a little bit out of realm of what we're talking today. Um, and it is and it is not. Uh, so um, I wanted to bring uh, to your attention uh, um, the other modalities that are important in our health, um, that every part of them could be helpful. We haven't talked about smoking. We haven't in, de in detail talked about sleeping, um, even exercising. But the, the, the treatment regimen, um, if you are not getting... Um, uh, relief by one. The good thing about today is we have so many different medications that uh, most of the time we could find uh, a regimen that can help with the patients, not 100% maybe, uh, but at least to give significant relief. Um, I don't know if you have tried uh, different uh, regimens or um, a couple of them. You can definitely talk to your rheumatologist to explore other routes and also combine things together. Combination is a key. So I hope I answered that question, of course. I think so. I think that's great. Uh, so next question is, I know exercise is important, but inflammation and pain are not yet well controlled for me. So most forms of exercise aggravate symptoms. Do you have any suggestions? Should I wait until I have the disease better under control to begin? Um, not necessarily. And again, when I talk about exercise, I, um, I'm not talking about like start lifting weight, heavy weights and like do um, jumping and running for marathons. When you're in pain, things could be as gentle as um, chair Tai Chi could be as just as gentle as just stretching. But uh, in my opinion, uh, pain and even sensation of inflammation should not stop anyone from moving their body and moving their joints. Uh, but if we're in tune with, our, with ourselves and go with our own pace, uh, I think you can find a way to gently and safely do some exercises and get the benefit of that. 
Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions about uh, diet and nutrition. So I'm going to kind of oh move into one. Yes. I know we always get so many of these and are excellent questions. So uh, I know you spoke a lot about the Mediterranean diet in your presentation. Yeah. What do you think, um, and you touched a little bit on this as well, but maybe we could talk a bit more. What do you think about the low carb or no carb diet, okay. also sometimes called the London no starch diet? Yes. So th there was, I, I looked at the questions briefly. There, uh, I okay. did show uh, one slide had uh, something about the low mm -hmm. uh, starch diet, which uh, we think it works on Klebsiella. Um, so first of all, one diet doesn't work for everybody. I'm not a big fan of Mediterranean diet for everybody myself, because you really have to pick and choose. Um, I can also share with you guys that I'm a patient myself, not with AS, but I developed arthritis a few years ago. Still to this day, I don't understand the exact mechanism of that. But as my uh, biochemistry professor at uh, first year medical school always uh, taught us to repeat this motto. Uh, any symptom is a representation of a biochemical reaction in our body. So there is something that happens in my body. Um, so I, a few years ago, I had to go through an elimination diet to understand what is happening after all my tests, including inflammatory markers were normal, but I had a really significant amount of stiffness. I couldn't even get out of bed without so anyways, two months passed and I'm like, okay, I'm a rheumatologist, but I can still have rheumatological conditions. And um, when my lab test lab results and my workup for myself as a patient came back all negative, I went through diet and I did elimination diet. I didn't talk about elimination diet at all today, just for the sake of time. And I eliminated things that I could think of causing inflammation. And within five days, I started having reliefs and my stiffness started going away. It took me a year to find my, uh, my uh, trigger. And I wanna say it with care uh, when I say uh, my trigger is wheat. Um, I think we simplify things. Um, not all wheat is bad. Um, overall, the grains have become less nutrients, no, less nutritional, and the way they raise the crops uh, could be problematic, like glyphosates that they use as wheat killers uh, could be a problem. So it took me a few years to also find that if I consume small amount of wheat that is organic, I don't have that much symptoms. So I'm very familiar with the concept of diet and low carb diet, but it's hard to prescribe one diet for everybody. Uh, I share this story with my patients and I always tell them not everybody is like me. I do share it so that you can understand uh, the importance of food in our health. And if I didn't find out um, this about myself, I would have been definitely on medication by now. It would have been impossible for me to go on uh, with that much pain and stiffness. Um, so um, if you can try the low carb diet and see how it works for you do it it needs a lot of patience and precision and to to do this and uh, we it's very difficult to find a good study on diet nobody is going to sponsor a diet basis study and it's really hard to control what people eat at their uh, homes and it's hard to find a cohesive like if we say okay guys go and eat for example organic bread uh, every bread from every company could be different they can have ingredients that could trigger um, the symptoms and inflammation um, mm -hmm. I hope I'm answering the question as much as possible uh, for the time but please ask me if uh, you still are not satisfied with my answer about that. You know, it, it definitely sounds like it's such an individual thing. People react so differently. Um, so do you, is that something that you recommend sometimes to people to try an elimination diet and see? Yes. Okay. Yes. I do. Yeah, uh, yes. And I, I always joke and say, print a picture of mine, put it on the fridge. And every time you, you remember that you don't, you should not eat something that you like, you can throw a rotten tomato or a uh, or an egg in my picture. It's a hard thing to do. It's not easy, <laughs> you know, but yes, I think it's really worthwhile. The, the other challenge to that is I was very lucky to see my symptoms and changing my symptoms within a few days. And I still am able to like within two days, uh, but not everybody has that quick response. So that's where the patients and being meticulous comes to the picture, into the mm -hmm. picture, journaling, really like 
becoming in tune and mindful about day to day and meal to meal to see what is going on. Right. What you eat and how it makes you feel. Exactly. Understood. Um, okay. So I don't have to pronounce this word. Uh, Vasepa, V-A-S-C-E-P-A. I, I, I have to look into this. No, I'm not very You're familiar, not familiar with, with it. No. Okay. No problem. Um, so here's a one on the breathing exercises. Yes. How, oh, I just, so how frequent do you recommend? Um, what do you recommend as a frequency and duration for these deep breathing exercises? Oh gosh. Um, breathe um, breathing is such a vast concept, uh, something that is completely natural and, uh, we do it automatically. Um, they're all different, uh, uh, all different breathing exercises. There are four, seven, eight breathing, four in, seven hold, eight out. Uh, they usually recommend only do four, four cycles of that for anxiety, for pain, for insomnia. And then Wim Hof method, for example, that we talked about, by the way, I don't recommend Wim Hof to everyone. I haven't, I haven't started doing that. Uh, exposing yourself to that extreme of cold and you know we, ha we have to do this with caution and be really mindful about our own capacity and our own pace um, and uh, there are uh, kundalini yogas that people can practice and um, breathing with that um, and that could be different for everybody like how many times a day do they want to practice what i can tell you is as many times a day that you can remind yourself and you can remember to breathe mindfully if possible within the nose um it would be great um there is a good book i have not finished it yet uh, it's called breath a new science of a lost art by james nestor that could be uh, something that um, can help you about breathing especially he talks about uh, nasal breathing breathing versus mouth breathing um, nasal breathing one of the things that it does also is the uh, amount of ni uh, nitrogen oxide that releases through that uh, is much more than mouth breathing um, and can have a lot of uh, uh, favorable physiological effect. Um, I do remember whenever I can, I try to uh, do some breathing e uh, exercise, even within a very hectic day, uh, as I'm like seeing patients, I can just take a moment and focus on my breathing and make sure I'm breathing in and out uh, through the nose. And um, yeah, but there's so many different breathing and methods and practices. Yes, thank you. And you see an immediate kind of a reaction or yes. immediate impact, which is so rewarding. Sure. Um, I have a, I have a few comments on the, this concept of joy. Uh, many people were really touched and loved that you mentioned that. You know, that thank you, um, thank you for mentioning it. Mahalo about that. Can you can you speak a little bit more about joy and this concept and? Um, I think really joy has an important physiological um, effect on us. I think as a child, we are more in tune and uh, close uh, with that. And as we get older and we get busy, uh, we forget that we did things that really like gave us joy. Um, and it could be as simple as listening to music. Uh, music has been always a really big factor in my life. I'm unfortunately not a musician, but I'm a music lover. But um, I do listen to music even when I see patients, but um, I take time sometimes. I make a point to take five minutes uninterrupted, not when I'm texting, not when I'm answering an email, um, not when I'm working on a project, just five minutes to listen to that, to the music and really take it in. Or um, I ask my patients to do that and not always, but I love to do it on a daily basis. Take five minutes to dance if that's something that brings you joy. Uh, cook a meal. And it's been a great journey for me to ask my patients because I love just seeing them uh, having a you know, spark in their eyes, remembering, oh, that's right. Despite the pandemic, despite my pain, despite everything that's going on, um, I could still have a five minutes in my life to do this. I can like 
paint something for a few minutes. I can cook and, oh yeah, I can cook with my daughter. And, you know, it could be as simple as that, but we have to bring joy back to our life despite everything, despite the life at the time of, you know, Corona, as I said, uh, it really has a healing property to it. It reminds us that we're alive. We're not just living. Wow. That's, thank you. That's, that's so lovely and so important to hear. And you're right. I think, you know, possibly no other time like this past year has remembering to, you know, to find what brings you joy. So important just for our mental health, our wellness. Um, so thank you. Thank you for mentioning that and discussing that. That was, and uh, was sorry, let me just needed. add one last sentence to that. Uh, when we do, uh, enjoy when when we pay attention to our joyful things uh, we are in the moment we're present and out of, out of a sudden and automatically we're practicing uh, mindfulness as well and being in, in present which is the only real time we have and gratitude as well yeah. possibly mm-hmm. yes okay well that is all the time we have for questions today Dr. Dalitzdabi, we can't thank you enough for so generously sharing your time and expertise with us. It's been informative and it's also been a real pleasure to have you with us. So thank you for accepting our invitation and for giving of your time today. Of course, thank you so much for having me. And sorry, it was, I had to jump from one concept to the other. I hope you just take it as an introduction and uh, um, you can explore. There's so many amazing information out there and uh, I would love to be available and uh, guide you if I could be a good guide. And finally, a special thanks to our corporate members, Novartis and Apvi for their financial support of this program provided through educational grants. And once again, thank you to everyone who attended our virtual seminar today. We've enjoyed hosting you and hope you've enjoyed your time spent with us as well. Thank you, everyone. Until next time.